Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Digital North American FPNA board meeting. Today we will look at how traditional budgeting to be better and beyond budgeting um, as a subject matter. My name is Hans Govin. Uh, I am uh, interim finance director, FBNA board, and FBNA trends ambassador, and I'll be facilitating this meeting for you today. Just so you know, we have over 400 people joining us today from 35 countries, mostly from North America, though. So we've got 40, sorry, 82% of people joining us from the North American region. So let me share with you what we'll be talking about today. So on the agenda, we've got, uh, of course, beyond budgeting, business agility in practice. We have case studies for you on how to move to beyond budgeting. We've also got a case study on rolling forecast, which is uh, you know, one of the first steps of beyond budgeting. The importance of technology for better and beyond budgeting. We will have conclusions and recommendation, and then we will have a Q&A session. Uh, just listed out here is a list of meetings we've already done in North America. So please uh, have a quick read of it. And um, there's some articles as well written on it. It is now a great time for me to introduce to you our uh, panelists for the day. So I'll invite the panelists to come and join uh, me on the webcam. Uh, panelists, if you can join me, please, that would be great. Our first speaker for today is Steve Player. Steve is North America Program Director for Beyond Budgeting Roundtable uh, and works with Beyond Budgeting Roundtable members, company members, to implement continuous planning. Steve has got over 30 years experience in improving performance management and implementing strategic planning processes. He's also co-author of a couple of great books, How to Master Business Forecasting, Future Ready, and Beyond Performance Management, as well as another five books. Steve joins us from Texas, and today he will talk to us about Beyond Budgeting, Business Agility in Practice. Steve, great to have you as a panelist today. Hans, it's my pleasure. Looking forward to addressing the group. Thank you very much, Steve. Our second presenter for today will be Naveen White. Uh, Naveen White is a VP Accounting at Hargrave Communications Group. Naveen has got uh, over 30 year career in finance, but very much leading FPLA functions uh, at TW Telecom and now in Hargrave. Uh, her journey at Hargreaves started in 2019, uh, where she will share with us the small steps she is taking to go towards beyond budgeting, but also share with us uh, the big steps she took at TW Telecom on beyond budgeting. Um, today, she is joining us from South Carolina. Naveen, great to have you with us today. Thanks, Hans. Great to be here. Thank you very much, Naveen. We're also joined by Matthew Mori, who is Senior Director of Finance Analytics and Business Performance at DAI. Of course, Senior Finance and Business Intelligence uh, Professional overseeing project accounting, financial forecasting, advanced analytics, uh, business unit focus on US federal government. Uh, Matthew has a lot of experience in system implementation, financial planning systems, business logic, business process improvement, instructional design, finance team transformation, uh, and has also published BI and a finance author. Matt joins us from Washington DC today um, and will share with us insight in how he is implementing rolling forecasts, which is one of the first steps of uh, beyond budgeting. Matt, great to have you with us today. Thanks, Hans. Good to be here. Brilliant. And finally, we have uh, Michael Lengenfelder as our fourth uh, panelist. Michael is head of FPNA product management at Unit 4. 
Uh, Matt joined former Prevero 15 years or so ago as consultant and has been part of the unit for FPNA journey ever since, with a broad range of experience and knowledge in consulting and FPNA application. Michael joins us from Vienna today and will today share with us how technology can help us in beyond budgeting. Michael, great to have you with us. Thanks for having me, Hans. Looking very much forward to the session. Panelists, thank you very much. We have great, uh, four great panelists, mostly from USA. Michael is joining us from Vienna, as I said. So uh, looking forward to the insight you're going to share with us. Thank you very much. If you could uh, uh, turn off your webcam, I've got a few more slides to take uh, the members through today, and then we will start with our first presentation. So projects and initiation, FPNA trends, just to highlight, we are in 27 cities, 16 countries, and four continents. And today we're bringing together the North American chapter or chapters like New York, Boston, San Fran, Seattle, Chicago, Toronto, Houston, and Washington, DC in one digital format. Um, just wanted to also highlight to you on demand from our members, we've started best practice workshop and consultancy so please be on the lookout for that so what is the digital fpna board it is a 90 minutes webinar your participation is via the four polling questions we will field today so please uh, give us your insight and vote uh, there is an interactive q a session at the end uh, but please if you can ask a question as from now via the chat box that'll be great uh, we will try and answer as many questions as we can today uh, those unanswered will be answered directly to you via email um, you can network directly with us via linkedin the presentations are available for you in the handout so please download them uh, you will receive the recording and a copy of the presentation within two days after the meeting um, and finally, there is a feedback se session when I close uh, the meeting, uh, a brief survey to give us feedback on ways to improve. So please do give us your feedback. It is now a good time to thank our uh, technology partner, which is Unit4 and our sponsor. Uh, as we all know, Unit4 is a global leader in enterprise cloud software for people-centric organization. Unit 4, thank you very much. Without you guys, uh, we wouldn't be able to hold this meeting today. A good slide to start off with, and I'm sure you know all of us have seen this before, um, a great introductory slide. Uh, hockey stick planning, as we all know and heard of. Uh, where you see this sudden miracle that happens uh, halfway through, um, where either revenue spikes or in other places costs massively drops when you see things like that you start to realize that hang on you've got an issue this is where traditional budgeting and planning doesn't work anymore uh, it's about other things than managing the business and when you see this it's time to start thinking about beyond budgeting i would like to share with you um, a quote from the chairman of the Young Budgeting Institute, Bjarte uh, Bognes. Um, so what is beyond budgeting? Why move away from traditional budgeting? We saw over the past year that budgets and forecasts in a period of COVID or unknown unknown became irrelevant very, very quickly because they are not agile, they're not flexible, they're not adaptable. Often the purpose of budget being very different to managing and steering uh, the ship. Um, the main purpose of beyond budgeting is liberation from dictatorship, micromanagement, number worshipping, calendar periods, hierarchies, secrecy, and sticks and carrots. I'm not going to go into this uh, in a lot of detail because our fellow panelists will elaborate on uh, most of them. So I will now move on. Uh, just to share with you, we will talk about these four different things today, business agility, case studies, rolling forecasts, and technology. Um, I would like to now introduce our 
first speaker, Steve Player, who is again Program Director North America at Beyond Budgeting Roundtable. And Steve will talk to us about business agility in practice. Steve, the floor is yours. Over to you when you're ready. Thank you, Hans. I, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, thanks for the warm introduction and for setting everything up here. Your hockey stick slide was always interesting to me because so many times I've been in planning situations and it, you're okay if you can just hang on long enough till the miracle happens. And the problem is that I think we found, and certainly with our Beyond Budgeting research, is that the miracle doesn't happen because we're not doing the work to make it happen. So much of the time, what has happened within finance is we've got caught up in the ritual. We've got caught up in pulling together the numbers. We've got caught up in the back and forth negotiation, the multiple iterations that go to, to creating a budget to begin with. And so those things that, that are the mechanics, in many cases, detract us from the real work of figuring out well, how to do work better, how to find better products, how to get the customers served more effectively. And that's what, what we really got to do is find ways to free up finance. And that's what we'll talk about today in terms of the business agility. The pandemic of 2020 certainly uh, showed us that, and we certainly spilled over into 2021. How do we build a world that deals with these things where you can't plan in the future? Let's go to the, the, the first slide, Hans, and let me kind of take people through that. Uh, we've been featured, so many of you here in North America may have seen the CFO Magazine cover stories. This was our fourth one, uh, Breaking the Budget, uh, an article I wrote uh, with Paige Levitt and Rachel Collins of the APQC. And really, it's really about where finance is positioned. When you look at your finance organization, and particularly your FP&A team, what is it the work that we're trying to do? And when you look at, at what's out there, in many cases, we find ourselves you know, somewhere on the boat, but we're not exactly sure. When I ask this question in seminars, I get a lot of different answers. We're, we're down in the engine room, but the engineers don't want us anywhere near them. We're, we're sitting on the hatch to keep the auditors from wandering around aimlessly. Well, I'll submit to you in most situations that where finance finds itself is we're at the back of the boat and we're staring at the wake and we're looking at the past and we're trying to say, we're going about this fast and we might be turning. And frankly, we just can't add a lot of value from that. We've got to figure out how to move ahead. So next slide, Hans. We'll try to shift around. And there's certainly a number of efforts that we've been trying to shift around. The most visible one you may have heard of is this zero-based budgeting, particularly if you're in the consumer products industry. And it's a 1970s concept. It's a fine concept. The problem is, is it tackles everything as if it's a clean sheet of paper. And when I think about the world that we live in today, I ask myself a question, is the world really a clean sheet of paper? Or when we plan, is a better way to think about ourselves as much more like a, a, a ship out on the ocean? I'll submit to you what you are is really a ship, and, and you're the accumulations of thousands and thousands of decisions that have made in the past. Decisions about what products you're going to offer, what people you're going to hire, what markets you're going to serve. You have created a cost structure, a cumulative cost profile, if you will, that's created revenue producing capabilities. Now, hopefully you're producing more revenue than you have cost, because otherwise you got a leaky ship. If you got more cost than revenue, you got to fix that problem quickly. But if you really think about planning, what we're doing is we're looking at what kind of ship we have, what kind of a cumulative cost structure we have. If you go to the next slide, Hans. And what we're really trying to do in the entirety of strategic planning is a transformation. Every time we do a plan, we're trying to affect a transformation of going from the ship you see down in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen there, the old bucket of boats that's based on all the decisions we've made in the past and all the ramifications and how those ships have aged and deteriorated. And we're trying to transform. We're trying to move up into that upper right-hand corner there in terms of, of, of what the ship needs to look like. What is our strategic vision five years out? What kind of ship do we need? And then what kind of projects and initiatives do we need to, to institute to make that all happen? And the thing that makes this really hard for organizations is you've got to make those transformations at the same time that you're constantly navigating the waters. You're sailing the whole time. You're continuing to move forward. And that's what makes this really hard. So that's really what planning is all about, is, is really affecting and making strategic plans happen, converting from where you were to where you want to be. Now, when we take all that together, we put it into the process and we put a, a tool together to do that, we create a budget. 
And what we found from budgets, which are basically a hundred year old tool, they're built on the, you know, they're off a framework that was articulated by James McKenzie back in the 1922. And we're still on that same basic framework. We've got computers to make it faster, but we still get together once a year. We annually try to transform. And what happens is, is we go to the next slide, Hans. What's happened is that we try to come together and make that go forward is that we wind up taking the budget and try to make it do too many things. From the mission, we try to set targets, align incentives, agree what actions to take to reach those, those targets, allocate resources to take those action plans. And because no part of the organization does it by itself, we coordinate and try to figure out how to pull all that together. That all goes together and creates this annual budget that we have. And the annual budget that we have is then we come back and look at it on a monthly, quarterly, and annual basis to see we're on track. Sounds very, reg very controlling, sounds like you know, a lot of what we try to do. But the reality is when we put all that together, we've taken a number of different purposes and molded them together. And we've actually created so many different things we're trying to do that it's impossible to achieve. If we pull that apart, my friend Biarte Bagnes articulates this well in his book about implementing Beyond Buzzing. If you separate, then you can find ways to improve. So we look at the four main groupings, targets and rewards. Well, what we really want targets and rewards to be is we want them to be, we want to improve them. We want to make them you know, better. We want to aim to be the best. You want to reach for the stars. But if I come down to the second purpose on planning, where I look at forecasting and kind of what's out there with that, I really can't go with, with, with that. I've got to go with, um, with something that really helps me move forward. I want a realistic forecast. I don't want an aspirational forecast because if I put that together, I, I begin to, to, to stretch too far instead of thinking about where we're really going. And if I don't know where we're really going, I don't know how far off the target we are and what kind of corrections to make. Resource allocations, they get caught up in the whole, the whole you know, attachment to things. The performance measures, all these things get, get bundled together. If we pull them apart, and that, what we found in Beyond Budgeting is better ways to do each one of those things as we move forward. And so that's going to be the key, and you're going to hear from uh, two great presenters here that are going to talk about the work they're doing to do a better job of planning. In North America, our emphasis has always been on trying to do a better job of planning. So we don't want better budgeting. We want better planning. And in many cases, what a lot of you trying to do is fix your budgets. Your budgets are, to use a lean term, they're not fit for purpose. And you can work on tweaking that a lot, but if it's not fit for purpose, it often will never be fit for purpose. So you really need to pull that back and say, if I'm gonna deal with an agile, ever-changing world, I need to move into a more nimble, more forward-looking, rolling forecast kind of way and a planning process that pulls these things apart and tries to attack them differently. If you go to the next slide, what we're really trying to do is get finance off the back of the boat. Instead of staring at the past, we're trying to make it look forward in terms of what's going on there. We want to get you up there on the bridge beside the captain. And we want you looking into the future, helping make decisions. In that hockey stick situation, we want you working on where that pass has to go next. We want you working on what has to happen to make those miracles occur and not wait three years for them to occur, but to have them coming throughout the process. So that's what we want to get into is in this more continuous basis. The trend I've seen that most impressed me in the last two years is the shift within software vendors to change the way they describe their systems. They don't talk about doing budgets anymore. They talk about continuous planning. Uh, uh, you're going to hear Michael talk about the word they use at, uh, at uh, Unit 4 is constant planning. Everybody understands that we can't do this in a once a year event. If you're doing a once a year ritual, you're just never going to be fast enough. You've got to figure out how to build that into the management system to where it's an ongoing purpose. And if it's an ongoing part of the business, you don't need the big annual spike. The thing we've got to get out of in finance is we're too much in spiky mode. We're too much in, in really focusing on trying to get to the annual spike. If you go to the next slide, Hans, I'll end with this one. Is what we're really trying to get to is where we've got a constant, continuous planning cycle. We're always moving forward. We're always planning, doing, checking to see how we do, and then coming back and planning again. We're in this constant evolution, not the once a year event, but in the constant moving forward. So this, this slide is really our capstone slide of showing how we're moving to rolling forecast, and Matt will talk about what they've done. Naveen will describe what they've done, but that's what we're going to try to move toward is 
how do we get that continuous cycle going? And we're very excited in North America that we've got some great companies that are doing that. We'd invite any of you to, to join us. Uh, uh, just shoot me an email or send us a question. I'm sure you've got a thousand questions about this. Put those in the questions and we'll try to get back to you. But let me turn it back over to Hans and, uh, and uh, keep the program going here. Hans? Steve, thank you very much. Um, love the last couple of slides, especially the one with uh, purpose and, and improve separate and improve is the key thing you know uh, just looking at, at how you break down each component and then how you take it forward and attack each one of those so thank you very much for that steve uh, can i ask my fellow panelists to come and join us now um, and give us some comments on um what uh, steve has just taken through taken us through so Naveen, can i come to you please yeah absolutely um I think I'd like to re-emphasize how important it is where you position finance in the organization. Embedding your finance team not only makes them better business partners, it also helps with a lot of things like shortcutting decision cycles and, and, and such things. So the, the location of finance and the analogy of bringing them up next to the captain, I think is really, really important. Close to the decision making. Matt, can I come to you, Matt, please? Yeah, sure. There's two things I picked up from Steve's uh, presentation that uh, really ring home for me. One is the whole notion of freeing up finance uh, to do finance. I actually talk a little bit about that in my presentation. Um, you know, because when we look at the time that we spend on on forecasts or building a budget, it's you know a lot of administrative work. And then the second thing is is one thing that I keep uh, thinking about time and time again, and that's the idea of aspirational forecasts. Um, because you know you really want to gear your forecast to where the ship is going as opposed to like where you want it to be. And I feel like a lot of times at the end of a forecast, you just end up with an aspirational forecast with a plug here or a plug there. Thank you, Matt. Uh, and finally, Michael, your comments, please. Um, I noted down two points that were um, re really important from, from Steve's presentation. The one is the fact that he started from the strategic vision which uh, I fully buy. Um, I think you always need to have your strategy, your vision um, as a starting point. I will actually also talk about this and always refer back to it whenever you think about your budget that you execute um, as a company while you are existing. And of course, the continuous constant uh, planning, I fully buy that too. It, it's not a one time in the year effort. Um, things are changing way too quickly, so it needs to be a constant effort. Fantastic. Thank you, panelists. And Steve, thank you very much for a great presentation. Let us now um, move on to our first polling question and listen from our uh, members today as to how they feel about their budgeting uh, process. I'm just going to launch the first polling question, which I've just done. So please, if you can give us your vote, please. So how long is your current annual budgeting process? Uh, first option, we do not do any budgets. Second, less than a month. Third, between one and three months. Uh, fourth, between four to six months. And five, over six months. If you can vote, please, that would be great. Uh, I can see 60% have voted already, which is excellent. I'll give it um, another few seconds and I will close. So is it, we do not do, not do any budget, less than a month, one to three months four to six months or over six months. I am now going to close the poll and I'm now going to share um, the outcome. So 2% have said we do not do any budget, 5% less than a month, 53% are still spending between one and three months. Amazingly, 36% four to six months and 5% over six months. Can I ask um, Steve, uh, and Naveen for some comments, please. Steve, if I may come to you first. Yes, uh, it doesn't surprise me. These numbers are, are somewhat comparable. Uh, we have seen greater numbers of do not budget. So those 2% out there, call us. We, we've got we got case studies to share. If you're down to less than a month, you're, you're certainly approaching some world-class bills. But those people that are four to six months or six, months or greater you've got some major opportunity you're wasting a tremendous amount of time in negotiation and kind of back and forth if you're one to three you're kind of stuck in the middle so i'd urge you to to, to move on up and and figure out how can i make this more effective how can i streamline this in terms of what's there 
Thank, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, Navi, your comment, please. Well, I think um, sort of building on Steve's point, it's not at all uncommon to be in that one to six month time frame. I think that's where most obviously most people exist. And it, it does make you want to ask that hard question. Is that the best use of these very expensive resources? Who odds are you have involved in this process? And how can you figure out ways to just not have them that tied up? And I, I look forward to sharing some of the experiences I've had because they speak to exactly this point. Thank you. Um... In the bean, thank you, Steve, and and members, thank you very much for voting. So, uh, if I hide this now and we move on to our next presentation, um, our next presentation we will be looking at two case studies from Naveen White, who is vice president accounting at Hargrave Communications, and as I mentioned, Naveen will be talking to us about a couple of case studies. Uh, Naveen, the floor is yours. Ready when you are. Thank you, Hans. Um, it, it, to say that our world has changed is probably the understatement of the year, but I'm thinking about it in the context of how we work. It feels to me like I no longer work with people. I work with gurus and black belts and scrum masters, and we retro things instead of reviewing them, and we zoom and huddle instead of meet. Um, we have to have mindsets. We're lean and we're agile. And that's all great. I mean, those are the signs. That's the language of progress. But it isn't actually progress if you're just using those buzzwords to make people think that you've done something in terms of leaning into some of these management constructs and operational efficiency processes. If you haven't actually changed anything that matters, it's really not important whether you call it beyond budgeting or lean accounting or finance agility. Um, if you haven't changed those, transformed those key things that help make the business better, better it's just throwing around some buzzwords. Transformation is hard work. Um, I know this because I've done it. I had the, I've had the good fortune of having worked for high-tech telecom companies for most of my career. And for 20 years, I was the VP of FP&A for TW Telecom. Hans, if you'll go to that next slide, please. Uh, TW Telecom was a publicly held a telecommunications company with networks all across North America. And we had a business problem to solve. Our business problem was that budgets got in the way of us growing our business. And primarily it was because the industry, the sector, the customers were all shifting constantly. The technology change was tremendous. And so we anchored ourselves in this annual budgeting process that really inhibited our ability to flex and to grow with the business. Our journey into transformation started in January 2004 when my boss, the CFO, came back from our board meeting where our budgets had just been approved. And he takes this giant tome of a budget book that my team and I had spent the better part of the last six months putting together hundreds of schedules at an incredible amount of detail for our board. And he tells me in the same breath that, as in like, hey, this is approved, that it's a useless tool in terms of managing the business. And he takes it and literally throws it in the trash can right in front of me with the words, find a better way. So that led me doing some research and I came across the Beyond Budgeting book that had been published a few months earlier. It was written by Jeremy Hope and Robin Frazier. And from that book, I distilled a vision for our company to move forward. The tactical part of that was very easy for me. I'm a finance geek, I know how to do the tactics. And so we very quickly decided that getting rid of budgets was easy if we replaced them with rolling forecast. Call that done. What I didn't quite realize was that how much of our processes and the way we do business, I was gonna break in the process of doing that. The budget is inextricably intertwined with all kinds of other business processes, be this how you approve um, costs and, and spending approvals, target setting, compensation, resource allocation, the budget plays in all of those arenas. And when you eliminate it, you break a lot of things. So through necessity, we went about replacing and rebuilding a lot of these processes and, and in the process really trying to avoid the bureaucracy that we previously had had to work with. Um, it made us more nimble, more um, agile, if you will, even though we didn't call it that. But most importantly, it just made things better for us. But I had a few key foundational things that really made that possible. Hans, if you'll flip to that next slide, please. We had some important building blocks. First and foremost, I had an executive leadership team that was willing to, to embrace the idea of a disruptive change to fix our business problem of becoming more responsive to our customers and more agile in the marketplace. We also had figured out that change management was a key um, gap for us, that we weren't very good at it. And so we had just recently hired somebody who was an expert in this area to try and build this as a cultural strength for us. 
And so I learned a ton about um, how you enroll stakeholders, which is something finance does not normally do. We typically dictate at people what they have to do. And so learning about how to communicate better, how to test the messaging to make sure that what I was saying was actually getting through, those all became real foundational to our transformation. And then finally, um, our organization was in a place where we were culturally ready to make this kind of a revolutionary change. And that's really important because no matter how much I advocated, no matter how much I wanted to do things, if the culture and the organization aren't ready to shift, it's not gonna happen. If you'll flip to the next slide, please. So we went from a static planning process that took us the better part of six months and pretty much sucked in all our leadership um, to a dynamic rolling forecast uh, that took us to about a two week window, four times a year, um, created a quarterly rolling forecast for us. And I know from our systems that most of our frontline leaders spent about two hours actually working on their forecast. And how do we do that? Well, we really focus things down on what's important and relevant. And so for our field business units, they really only had to forecast 45 line items, which is that many because they also had to do our revenue projections. For our corporate departments, it was down to 18 because again, we really condensed and get them focused in on what was the most important stuff. And we only had them forecast two quarters. And I literally mean two quarters, not six months, but actually two quarters out because that's the cadence that we figured out our business ran on. They couldn't see further than that. And so that's all we asked them to do with the finance team then adding the subsequent months onto the rolling forecast. Now I'll tell you, our first process, it was not rainbows and sprinkles. It was pretty awful, actually. The process was clunky. Our leadership was confused after years of doing budgets and there were more questions than answers. But um, we leaned into another buzzword. We failed fast and we failed spectacularly. <laughs> um, we dusted off, we learned from, from our mistakes and we adapted and we tried again and we get better and better and better. I'll tell you the entire 10 years that we ran that company without budgets, um, we constantly tinkered with the process because the environment in the business was constantly changing. So this was not like we did this and done. This was an ongoing forever kind of transformational exercise. Um, it was extremely successful. Our forecast did what it was supposed to do, which is inform our leadership so they could act on what was happening around them. And we embedded our finance team to make them better business partners and really help with all aspects of this part of the constant planning that we were doing. Um, the entire time, that we ran that company, uh, we really figured out what happened in terms of benefits to the business. And that had to do with letting our functional leaders get back to the jobs they were hired to do. Sales leaders were able to focus on selling to our customers. The operational folks were able to focus on the network and getting services up and running. And um, it, it really took them out of the business of having to spend so much of their time on budgets. I'm never going to say that TW Telecom was as successful as it was because we eliminated the budgets, but the 10 years that we did um, operate that company without budgets, um, we delivered 40 consecutive quarters of top line revenue growth. And that included 2008 and the years of the mortgage crisis and the subsequent recession. So there is something to be said for letting your functional leaders work at the job they're hired to do. Hans, if you'll go to the next slide, please. I now work for uh, another telecommunications company called Harger Communications Group. I'm the VP of accounting, but I manage all the operational accounting functions as well as the tactical FP&A function. And we are the local cable, telephone, and data provider in small communities here in the Southeastern United States, um, a company that really thrives on living to its purpose and our customer mission, which is to, to deliver customer delight. Um, I'm sure you're all waiting for me to tell you how incredibly beyond budgeting this company is. Let me tell you something, we're not there yet. I can't take what I did at TW Telecom and copy paste it over to Harger and expect it to work. Um, this organization is not culturally ready to do that. Um, here, it's gonna be an evolution, not a revolution. And we're taking baby steps in the right direction. We're working on our rolling forecast. And again, the first couple times through has not been pretty, but we're getting there. And we've also significantly simplified our budgeting process. We're now definitely in that one to three month um, arena. So we're, we're getting there. And we've disconnected some of our compensation at the department level from our budgets. And those are all steps in the right direction to making us um, more agile in terms of a finance organization. I have an incredible team here. They're able to flex and, and respond to very disruptive things like hurricanes and pandemics. And that's really what we're focused on right now is sort of taking one business problem at a time and moving beyond the old. Um, and so it's gonna take us a while longer to get there, but we're making great progress. Uh, but we focus on what's urgent and important first and foremost, and we work through our problems with courage and agility um, to make us successful. 
And that's the vision for my team. And I hope um, the same for you and your team. And with that, thank you. Back to you, Hans. Naveen, uh, you've just shared with us two great case studies. Uh, um, and uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of organization are at the very beginning, which is where you are with Hargrave. So uh, it's not about big bang. It takes time. It takes hard work. And you've just showed, you know, 10 hard years of work you know, took a uh, uh, budget completely out of the equation and also the benefits. So thank you very much for that. I would like to uh, invite uh, the fellow panelists to come and join us and give us some comments uh, on, on Nevin's um, case study, please. So uh, Steve, if I may start with you, please. Sure, Hans, happy to happy to comment here. Um, three quick things, Nevin. I love the story from TW Telecom about how do you get finance freed up to support the business? How do you get them up on the front lines in support of decisions? You you got to earn your seat at the table, but you earn that by being there and being with people and 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 asking the right questions instead of dumb negotiation questions. So I, I love that part. I also love the fact that the message of when you get to Hargrave that you can't just cut and paste. You can't take what you did, even though you know it's successful, you can't just drop it in. You've got to customize, and that's a good message for everybody listening on this, this webcast. You've got to customize it for your business. Everything we're talking about here has to be customized for what will work with you. And I love this this little quote you have from Sidney Smith. It's the greatest of all mistakes to do nothing because you can only do a little, do what you can. Uh, we've all got to be able to do a little bit. I like that quote so much. It's this week's uh, Weekly Wisdom, our, our weekly quote series that uh, everybody can sign up for. Do what you can. And that's that's what we've got to do in finance is always keep figuring out what can we do and do that. Do what you can. Thank, thank you very much, Steve. Matt, can I come to yourself for some comments, please? Yeah, sure. There's uh, two points that I was going to make. Um, one, when Naveen was talking about determining the cadence and how she was just going to go down to two quarters, um, that seems like a very scary notion for any finance person. Um, but it's one of those kind of brave steps you have to take, particularly in that evolutionary process towards beyond budgeting. Um, it's, it's extremely important to figure out what your time horizon really is and what's important. Um, the second one was on, you know, when she talks about the uh, the, the forecast and kind of failing spectacularly, I can't, rainbows and sprinkles, I think, were, was what she used. Um, you know, as we're, as we're going through our first, you know, attempts at rolling forecasts, it definitely feels, you know, disorganized. We're learning as we're going, um, but more than ever, we're just kind of trying to fail fast and pick ourselves up and, and improve, you know, in the next in the next round. Thank you very much uh, for that, Matt. Uh, Michael, comments from yourself, please. <clears throat> well, I noted down two points. Um, the first one was the executive sponsorship. Uh, fully support that, Naveen. Uh, not just from a perspective of changing a budgeting process, but also what I see in practice oftentimes for implementing uh, a tool, right? Uh, I think for both changes, um, you definitely need support from um, executives uh, to make it work. So that's an essential um, point for success. And the second one I really liked was the focus point, right? So uh, focus on the essential things for you it was reducing the details um, that you did in your forecast and planning and I still would argue that's the piece of art for every organization to find the right level of detail of planning and forecasting and focus on the value drivers that are worth focusing on. Michael thank you very much. Panelists thank you very much for comments on uh, Naveen's presentation and Naveen thank you very much for a, a great presentation. Let us now hear from our audience in terms of, you know, how they are doing in their budgeting uh, process. So I'm going to launch um, polling question two. Um, so where is your company in terms of beyond budgeting? Not considering it first, thinking about it, starting a beyond budgeting journey and have eliminated budgeting altogether. So. Members, if you can vote, please. Um, so not considering it, thinking about it, starting a beyond budgeting journey or a completely eliminated uh, budgeting. Uh, we have 60% voted already, so I'll give it a, a, another few uh, seconds before uh, we move on. Um, I'm noticing 
just about to close it now and I'm going to share um, the results. So 29% are not considering it at all, 41% are thinking about it, 29% have started the budgeting journey and 1% have uh, eliminated it completely. Uh, can I ask uh, Naveen and uh, Matthew to join me and give us some comments please? So Naveen if I can start with you, quick comment please. Yeah, again, I'm not totally surprised. Um, this is this is hard work, and it especially requires you to really tear at some of sort of the core um, beliefs that you have in your cultural DNA. And so, I applaud everybody who's considering it and starting. Um, and those first steps are hard. And and I think um, Matt and I are kind of kindred spirits in this. That having been down this path, um, it there is definitely some moments where you're like waiting to exhale because it is just, it's it's a lot of difficult work, but I applaud you nonetheless for the courage to go there. Thanks Naveen, and, and Matt, your comment please. Yeah, same with uh, <clears throat> what Naveen was saying. I would, I guess I would add for those of you that are, are not considering it, maybe uh, pick up some of the literature, the books, um, you know, uh, Steve's webinar, webinars, um, you know, and, and kind of dive in because this uh, this journey means something different for every everyone. Um, I used to think it was a template, um, but it is definitely not. Uh, so I would just encourage those who are not considering it to uh, uh, to look into it if they haven't already. Absolutely, thank you very much, both. And and, and of course, you know, having a, it's it's all about small steps, isn't it? From Matthew, what you've just described, it's it's about reading up on it and and starting small. And and I'm sure you know the 41 and the 29% uh, can change their mind and work towards it. So panelists, thank you very much. I'm now going to hide the results and we move on to the next stage of our uh, presentation, which is on rolling forecast. And uh, to do the presentation on rolling forecast. We've got Matthew Murray, who's Senior Director of Finance Analytics and Business Performance at DI. Matthew, the floor is yours. Great, Hans, thank you. Um, on, the, on the next slide, I just kind of begin with um, a statement about, um, very similar to the quote that was on uh, Naveen's uh, last slides, that you know, this journey for us is, is going to take a lot of work. Uh, we're at the very beginning. Um, it feels like we've already put a lot of work into it. Um, I was developed. I was introduced to Beyond Budgeting probably about ten years ago, um, and we're we're just now getting going. Um, really need to focus on creating an entrepreneurial environment within your finance teams if you are a finance leader, um, and have the tenacity to kind of go through it. So on the next slide, um, just giving you an idea of where we're coming from. Um, my firm is a global development consulting firm. Um, we are divided into five business units and mine represents about 80% of the company and we're almost solely focused on uh, business with the, with the US government. Um, we implement foreign aid projects. So we have about 100 projects in 50 to 60 countries. Uh, so we're operating throughout the world, uh, various levels of finance understanding, acumen, um, internet connectivity, all technology, all different types of, of factors that go into how we plan. Um, our projects, this will become important a little bit later, our projects basically constitute the top line of our, of our P&L. Um, so as we talk about rolling forecasts, what we're really talking about is uh, forecasting our um, revenue and direct costs. Um, as I said, we're on operations in developing countries around the world. Uh, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary, so we've been a little, around a little while, and um, we're employee-owned, so we have a, an important uh, shareholder uh, uh, component as well to our forecasting. Okay, on the next slide, just want to give you an idea of where we're coming from. This probably will sound very typical to a lot of folks, um, particularly if you're, uh, you know, just starting or having have not started a beyond budgeting um, journey. Um, our planning process was very spreadsheet heavy, um, so my team was in the in the business of basically generating the templates, sending the templates around, collecting the templates, uh, aggregating the templates, loading the templates. Um, you know, just about everything related to the templates. Um, we provided some training um, on forecast methodologies, um, but we, you know, didn't really have any standard forecasting methodologies per se. 
Um, and, and as a result, we have to assume that there was a lot of bias that was going into, you know, we would send these templates out and people would fill them in and they have different ideas about what's material, what's not material, um, so on and so forth. Um, this last point here, we, we, when we started our rolling forecast, we wanted to initially improve our forecasting accuracy. And actually, since we've published these slides, um, you know, the, the continuous learning process that we're going through here, we're actually focused more on forecast reliability and how the forecast, um, you know, how, how reliable the forecast is uh, looking into the future. Okay, on the next slide, talk a little bit more about our vision um, for the future. Um, so as we've heard both with Steve and with Naveen, um, my vision for my team is that finance does finance. That we're no longer the template generators and collators. Um, and you know, at the 11th hour, we have to basically pass off uh, an analysis. Um, we wanna be the ones that are looking into uh, that analysis and driving decision-making. Um, we also would like to remove bias from the system. So we are working on a driver-based uh, forecasting model. Um, this is taking time for us. Um, as I'll talk about on the next slide, we are, you know, we're implementing a system and trying to, you know, chip away what our driver-based forecasting model would look like. Uh, we want to reduce the burden on operations. So as I said, you know, we send out the templates, we generate the templates, send out the templates. Um, that is to our operations department. And currently, um, the process is um, a couple of weeks, two to three weeks, which I guess in the grand scheme of things doesn't sound all that bad. Um, but during that two to three weeks, people, um, you know, cancel important trips out to visit our projects and provide technical assistance to those projects. Um, vacation plans are put on hold, all different types of things um, just to get the templates filled in and sent back to finance. Um, we want to significantly cut the time with greater accuracy and granularity. So as I said, uh, to create um, a project forecast, we're looking at, you know, probably from beginning to end about a month. Um, and, but we want to, um, we want to whittle that down even further, you know, with the hopes of getting to a day or two, um, you know, is, is kind of our aspiration. And overall, we, would, we just want to make people happier, think less about the finance and more about the technical assistance that we're delivering around the world. Um, the people that come to work for us, that's what they want to do. They want to, you know, go out and make sure that um, food security around the world is stable and that, um, you know, water is clean and all different types of programs that we, uh, that we run. Okay, and on the next slide, I give a couple of examples of how we're doing it, or to talk a little bit about how we're doing it. Um, so the first one is that we're, we're currently uh, implementing an agile financial planning and BI system. Um, so I talked about our driver-based model and that we're trying to make um, uh, progress on our driver-based forecasting model. Uh, this system has allowed us to already take out certain pieces that people that humans used to have to think about and you know for all intents and purposes put it into an algorithm put it into an equation um, and so as we as we continue down this implementation um, my plan is to do even more of that and then hopefully get to even something that may be an ai based type of planning um, but there is a lot of work that has to be done behind the scenes on the governance on on the drivers that uh, make up our model um, we're in government contracting so we have a very specific res revenue generation type of, of, of process uh, so there's a lot of work to be done there um, we're investing in i'm investing in the, what i call the techno functional makeup of my team um, so not only hiring finance oriented people but people that have the so-called data gene and curiosity quotient about data and technology. Um, these folks, they, they work very well with, um, you know, both being able to move your finance organization forward and also interpret the results. Um, you know, I've found kind of having behind the scenes uh, roles before, understanding the logic and how everything comes together. Um, sometimes I have a lot to add. <laughs> sometimes I have a lot to add to, to the analysis. Um, 
We are working on our monthly forecast methodology. Um, I've been trying to simplify things as we move through here, as Naveen kind of alluded to. Um, change management is a really big thing um, that's often kind of underestimated. So one of the things I've tried to do is break it down into, um, you know, into smaller chunks. And so right now we're, we've been using a mantra, baseline, revise, report, steer. Um, so baseline, um, the, uh, the system kind of produces the, uh, the baseline forecast. Right now, we have a chance to go in and revise it, kind of the human revise it. We are taking pieces of those revisions and trying to put it into our driver base model. And then we report, um, so reporting is very quickly, and then we steer the ship, as, as Steve would say. Um, and the last point that I wanted to make here is not underestimating change management. Um, there are a lot of change management formulas out there. Um, there have been a couple of very simple ones that have helped me, uh, uh, you know, kind of on my, my journey through all this. Um, I know that I've been in a place and probably still am in a place where I, I underestimate change management at time, but people are, are just as much, if not more part of this process than, uh, than, than your, your, your driver base model. Um, the finance that results of it, that results from the forecast and so forth. Um, and with that, Hans, I'll hand it back over to you. Matt, a uh, great example of um, a rolling forecast and, uh, you know, the pluses, the minuses, the challenges, as well as what are you done and what are you doing and your vision. So thank you very much for that. I would like to ask uh, a fellow panelist to join us now. Uh, and give us some comments on the, um, uh, Matt's presentation. Steve, if I may start with yourself. Sure, sure. Matt, uh, uh, I, I really like how well you describe what I think everybody experiences, but I haven't heard it articulated that well, how you describe how templates, for instance, just the management of templates, the gathering of templates, the herding of cats, templates, is really taking away, and how people cancel vacation, don't go to the field to support the business. We don't focus sometimes on the aspect of how that detracts from what we're really trying to do is support the business. So thanks for just highlighting for everybody how much the mechanics of, of, of doing that is really distracting from what we're trying to do. And I know you're in, in DC, so I'm really interested in this work on the data gene. Okay, I'd like to see what tests we've got so we can test everybody to make sure they've got the data gene. Because I know I don't have it, but but I'd like to find more people who do. Steve, thank you very much for that. Great comments. Uh, Naveen, can I come to yourself, please? Yeah, absolutely. I um, Again, just love what Matt's talking about. Um, I, I think one of the things that we find is people tend to shy away from these kinds of efforts because they don't have the capacity in the organization to move forward with something. So that's such hard work. And I think Matt described it really well that, you know, by making finance focus on doing finance things, you actually can create some capacity um, to be able to do these kinds of of important transformational type um, initiatives uh, because we all struggle with never having enough resources to do the things we want to do, let alone the things we have to do. And so I think that's a really important point. I think the other thing that um, I really, that resonated with me because it felt like deja vu was this whole conversation around accuracy. That is such a tough conversation to have and I feel for you because it is just finding that balance of, of accuracy and and not overreaching but at the same time looking at what's relevant and important i think it's just such i just remember these vivid difficult conversations we had on that topic so i, I just applaud you and i just root for you in terms of just moving on with this initiative so thank you oh brilliant brilliant comment there thank you very much naveen uh finally uh, to yourself michael well, I really, Matt, like the point, make people happy. I mean, how often do you see that on a finance presentation, right? And ultimately, I think that's what we all should aim for. Um, free time from administrative tasks and, you know, make people um, happy. And the second point that I fully agree with is uh, driver-based planning is a journey, right? Um, whenever you think you, you found it, you sold the puzzle, you need to stay on top of the game because it might change, right? So um, don't celebrate too much. You need to stay on top of it. Michael, thank you very much. Uh, panelists, thank you very much for your comments and, and Matt, great presentation. Thank you very much. 
Let us now hear from our um, uh, attendees, our members today, uh, via our next polling question, uh, which I will launch right now. Uh, so, polling question three, is your senior leadership ready to move away from budgets as a control mechanism? Uh, no, having a document to control is very important to them, which we find some parts of the organizations are ready. And thirdly, our senior leaders trust people to take the right decision. If you can vote, please, that would be great. Uh, also like to remind our attendees that they can ask a question via the chat box. We've seen loads of great questions already, so thank you. And we will try and uh, answer all of them, if not today, via email, very definitely. So. Um, we have uh, got 75% of people uh, voted already. I'm going to close the uh, poll and I'm going to share the answers. So 57% said no, having a document to control is very important. 40% some part of the organizations are ready and only 3% our senior leaders trust people make the right decision. Can I ask our panelists, uh, Matt and um, Michael to join us and give us some comments, please. So Matt, if I come over to you. Yeah, sure. I, I, I kind of wonder what this would have looked like, you know, uh, even just a couple years ago, um, um, because it, it doesn't surprise me that, you know, that the budget is still the budget, right? Um, we, have the, we have the same um, type of culture um, right now at, uh, at my company. Um, within within my business unit, you know, there there is leadership that is, um, you know, very interested to see, you know, how beyond budgeting could work. Um, and what I'm finding through my work is that you have to um, kind of chip away at those, you know, soft topics, those soft, not financial topics in order to uh, kind of, in a way, underscore the importance of beyond budgeting and kind of, um, you know, uh, lead them to um lead the lead them to the the water thank you very much for that matt uh michael your comments please well to be honest hans um moving away from budgets all over i think is um tricky right uh i think what we should go for in the beyond budget my personal opinion is uh, make it easier, make it quicker, uh, make it better. But getting rid of it, um, I think, is also dangerous because you need some sort of control for those simple questions of the finance life. How are things going? Where are we performing well and where not? And if you have a really hard time without budgets, I think, to uh, answer those questions. So um, I understand the results and I think... Um, in my understanding, it's less about getting rid of budgets, but more about how to improve um, working with them. Um, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Matt, for uh, the insight. And uh, uh, members, thank you for voting and sharing with us uh, where you are on that journey. Let me now hide this and we move to our next session. So our next session, we'll be talking about technology and to talk about technology, or the importance of technology for better and beyond budgeting. We have uh, Michael uh, Lengenfelder. I hope I've got this right, Michael, uh, who is head of FBN product management at Unit 4. So, Michael, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Hans. Um, we can directly jump into the first slide, and I would like to take you on um, a little journey. Um, when we think back on where uh, Steve started at the very beginning, um, he started with uh, the strategic aspects. And that's also the first point that I would like to make on, on my little journey, how technology can help us in, in budgeting. I clearly see that we should start the budgeting process always having in the back of our heads the strategic aspects and that means starting from the vision the mission why does our company exist what are we going for what's the ultimate goal once you break that down on um, individual goals and objectives and kpis you finally start reporting on them if we move to the next um example here um 
this is actually a unit four example. So as a cloud company, we've put a priority as a goal on, on cloud growth. And then we've determined to um, KPIs how we measure that. And those um, multi-year plans looking into the future should always be our reference points that we come back to whenever we do a budget. If we move to the next one um, as an example, and then we start uh, the reporting um, during the year where we monitor well, how are we performing against our initially set strategic goals. What we actually see if we uh, click to the next one, what we actually even see from that strategic process, it's um, that companies start more and more to even include um, the SDG, the Sustainability um, Development Goals of the United Nations, uh, which have an influence on the strategic aspects uh, of corporations, which might change uh, how they want to perform and what goals they set uh, for themselves. If we move on to the next one, Hans, um, a clear key area where software can support us in budgeting is the fully integrated financial planning. Well, what do I mean? If we look at this little chart, um, what you see here is a classic uh, planning overview for a company with the different sub plans in, in, in um, the top of the screen with sales planning, investment planning, etc. In the middle, in the gray box, you see uh, the profit and loss statement. Unfortunately, what I've often experienced um, in, in projects with customers, that's where they stop. So they don't uh, plan um, budget and forecast automatically their balance sheets and their cash flows. I think a situation that has changed um, with the pandemic of the last one and a half years, where we've seen how important it is to always monitor also um, the cash flow. What um, two points, additional points that I would like to point out here on this uh, little illustration. Uh, what in practice I often see and highly recommend is that in those sub plans, in those different areas, uh, to use uh, value drivers. Why? Well, because you increase the automation um, of the system. So uh, you're becoming a little more independent of all those mass data entries, the system applying. Um, the algorithms of the value drivers um, can perform on its own. And the second um, experience that we've made <clears throat> as a company is for those sub plans, um, the use of AI. So I'm very convinced that in the future for key areas like sales planning, um, in those FP&A tools, it will no longer be the entry of budgets by users, but um, artificial intelligence systems will load um, forecasts, suggestions into the system, which then again can of course be overruled by the users. So that's clear trends that I see uh, coming in the FPNA software area. If we move to the next one, um, a classic example of a rolling or um, as, as Steve said, continuous forecasting planning, and here we, we call it constant forecasting. In this little overview, you see in the middle area um, for a selected PL line, all your history, right? The recent last forecasts, the budgets. In the bottom area, you see um, a classic PL. And in this overview, um, in this concrete example, you have eight months um, of actual periods, and the gray area back there for the last four months are meant uh, for entry. So we um, indirectly see on this um, example, there's of course hidden top down, bottom up that you can easily do in, in such a, a software enabled um, input screen, those both data entry forms, top down, bottom up. You can of course do pre-fillings, et cetera. So um, a tremendous tool that when you compare it maybe with an Excel sheet, um, which it simply um, cannot do. And taking one or two steps back from the pure <clears throat> technology functionality uh, that FP&A tools can bring here, what I always say um, is really important about the constant forecasting, it's you basically have the finger on the pulse of the organization. So those entry forms should stay open at all times. You as an organization or finance department then just decide 
when the cutoff line is when you say, okay, now reporting time is, we close our forecast. But with an easy to enter uh, screen that we see here in this example, you should constantly have users enter new learnings, new findings about the future into the system. If we uh, proceed to the next one, Hans, um, a very obvious um, advantage of, of FPNA software um, is the workflow and status control. We all know those <clears throat> cases where we were looking for the last missing Excel sheet, sending emails, calls um, to get in uh, the last missing pieces. Um, in software, um, FPNA software, this is simply included that you have such overviews and constantly know where are we, what are we missing, whom do we need to chase um, to submit their data. If we proceed to the next one, what the um, pandemic has for sure um, shown, and click to the next one, Hans, um, is the very the, the the huge importance of the strategy simulation, what if simulations, that you can in a software tool immediately simulate what if the pandemic, what if a Brexit hits us in a certain PNL area, and then again if we proceed to the next one, of course immediately have the reporting functionality. Um, Hans, if you proceed to the next one, where you see, uh, but what does that mean? What's now the difference from an original budget or forecast um, in a PL overview? Or if we click to the next one again in a cash flow statement. And I, you know, I keep hammering home this message uh, how important it is to always uh, also have a look in your integrated uh, system on the cash flow. Well, um, if we move to the next slide, Hans, um, now we've done all that. We have the budget in the system, uh, and the logical logic next step is to, well, use it in reporting, um, and always have this comparison, which uh, in the polling question I mentioned, we need something to compare against to determine, well, how did we perform? Was it good? Was it bad compared to the original plan? And uh, the next example is then a perfect bridge for me. Um, one of my favorite stories is about the storytelling. Um, in an online FPNA tool, you immediately have the capabilities uh, to tell the stories. And if we click to the next one, there you use all your numbers, your budget numbers, your forecasts, your actuals, and um, you start explaining with comments um, what you see on the charts, what went well, what did not go that well. And I always mention, because usually in finance we think about where do we have issues, I'm also hugely interested in where are we overperforming because I want to recreate that success maybe in other areas. And with such um, storytelling functionality that we see here, um, you can explain that um, without digging into um, big tables and charts. It's a, a very easy to digest and consume overview. Perfect, and the last example is just another uh, visualization that um, I, I wanted to share for such a storytelling approach with uh, data and comments in a collaborative way. Back to you, Hans, thanks. Great, uh, uh, great to see how software can help us on this journey, Michael. And thank you for sharing uh, such an extensive set of slides. But actually, you know, taking us through that journey where each step and uh, uh, where we can help. And and I think for me, key thing was highlighting the fact that you know you are constantly also looking at your cash flow. And finally, the end piece for me here is all about storytelling as well. You know, that's the key point. So thank you for that. And can I ask my fellow panelists to join us and uh, give us some comments, please? Um, if I may start with uh, Steve again, Steve. I, I really like how these graphics start to pop. You've got the colors going, you've got a lot of different things going on there. Uh, obviously more than we can digest in the short amount of time that we have there, but. I like how you've thought through that, that that there is a storytelling element to it that we are trying to explain what's happening in the business and throughout the whole process of looking at the numbers you've got to be thinking through one of our key points in forecasting is make sure it's actionable 
and actionable means the numbers aren't just the numbers. They tell you what you need to do. And that's where I love to see this this kind of integrate together so that it's constantly reminding you what where are we and now what do we need to do next? Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you for that. Uh, Naveen, can I come to you, please? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to pile onto that storytelling comment. Um, it's something I'm extraordinarily passionate about because I think as finance professionals, we have a tendency to just dump data on people um, sort of irrespective of whether or not they understand it and really without giving them any guidance to get to sort of those key things that really are relevant and where we should get their eyes to focus. Um, and so quality of uh, visualization of data and curation of data, I think is so important when we try to communicate financial results to any business because odds are, you know, more than half the people in the room are not finance people or finance minded people. And so trying to convey those same messages to somebody who's more on, you know, on the operation side or in a different discipline is, is really, really important when you're trying to run a cohesive business. Thank you, Naveen. Um, Matt, can we come to you, please? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm an FP&A BI technology junkie. Um, I love the, the, the technology um, behind, you know, helping us plan better. Um, you know, Michael brought up a couple of really great points, the integration of all three, you know, all three um, financial statements and how important it is to plan those. Um, the other thing that I'm very, very interested to um, get into more is, uh, you know, the idea of using um, AI or machine learning in your in your forecasting process. I just think that these are going to be two extremely important um, pieces to, you know, better, faster driver based forecasting models. Um, so always excited to hear information about that. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you, uh, uh, panelists, and, and Michael, thank you for uh, taking us through how software can help us on that journey. Uh, let us now uh, move on and listen to what our members uh, got to say about technology. So I'm going to launch our um, final polling question for the day, uh, which is, how do you currently use modern technology in your organization? Uh, we use it, uh, to empower and drive cultural change. We use technology primar primarily as a driver of efficiency. We use technology primarily to strengthen command and control uh, or other. So please, if you can vote, that would be great. So technology to empower and drive cultural change first. Second, um, primarily to drive efficiency. Third, technology primarily to strengthen command and control, and fourth, other. Uh, give you guys a, a few more seconds uh, to vote. We've got uh, a great many uh, people voted already. I'm now just about to close uh, the poll and I will share um, the results. So we've got 15% uh, who use technology to empower and drive cultural change, 58% as a driver of efficiency, 16% to strengthen uh, command and control, and 11% for other. Uh, if I come to you, Michael, for some comments, and, and Matthew, Michael, first. Michael, you may be on mute. Yeah, uh, not anymore. Um, to be honest, uh, not a big surprise and i think that's one of the key areas also that i mentioned several times um the efficiency right uh with the value driver concept also ai what i see there it's um many options um not just today but also in the future how um technology will be able to even create more um efficiency and accuracy and ultimately what does that mean with creating efficiency we save time and if we have more time available um, in the finance department, we can use that again for more analysis, for better storytelling. So I think um, this is very good, uh, a very good point, and that's what we should uh, primarily also go for in the finance uh, departments. Thank you very much, um, uh, Michael. Can I come to you, Matt? Please, your comment. Yeah, sure. This is a this is a very thought provoking question for me, and I keep staring at the uh, the cultural change in command and control um, because I think I would have voted for the driver of efficiency myself. Um, 
but you know, when I think about like command and control, I think about technology delivering reports or you know uh, putting up dashboards for you know whether it's uh, some sort of variance analysis or or that type of thing. Um, and then driving cultural change, um, you know, kind of gets back to that storytelling. Um, you know, what story is it that you're telling about your data? You know, how are you driving decision making? Um, that type of thing. So it's an extremely thought provoking question for me that I'm probably going to still think about a little bit longer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your insight and for voting. If we now hide this and we move on with our presentations, well, not presentation, it is now a good time to start summing up and getting from our panelists um, their key takeaways. So I'll invite the panelists to join us with their webcam and mic. Uh, and then give us their quick 30 minutes, not minutes, 30 seconds key takeaway. Steve, can I uh, come to yourself, please, for a quick takeaway? Yeah, my quick takeaway is is everything's moving the right direction to become more agile and, and become more empowered as a FPNA function. But the challenge is we have got to let go of some past ways of tackling things, even to the point where we... I got to tell you guys, you want to keep tweaking and, and fiddling around with the budget. If you have to call it that, call it that. But realize you've got to fundamentally change most of the aspects of what's what you need to do to be able to move forward. So you've got to find a different way to give people a better way to keep themselves in control. It's reasonable to want to be in control. It's just the old broken down wheelbarrow of the budget won't get us there. We've got to find a way of showing much more real time, much more proactively how to continuously improve and keep moving forward. So we need to be looking for the ways to use the technology to, to improve and carry us forward. And each of us on each listener, each of us individually, when we work with companies, we've got to figure out what will this company's culture take? What, how do we get the call? How do we help this organization create a planning system that works better for them in, in the way that they run the business? Because it has to fit the way that it runs the business. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, Naveen, can I come to you for a quick comment, please? Sure. I think I'm just going to reiterate sort of that last quote I had on my slide. And it's um, about not being afraid to get started. This is daunting. This is scary. This tears at some of the very cultural fabric of your organization. But there's so much goodness to be had here. And so even if you can't do all of it, even if you can't go from zero to get rid of the budget altogether, um, take baby steps to make improvements in the FPNA area because all of that, freeing up capacity, freeing up your team, embedding them in the business, all those little steps just make such a huge impact in terms of how you just can be engaged and much more in the front of the ship, as Steve says, um, in, in terms of your FPNA organization. Thank you, Naveen. Uh, Matt, your key takeaway, please. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, well, got two main key takeaways. One is one is about um, the people, right? So whether whether any of the panelists explicitly stated it or implicitly, um, you know, we've got senior management here. We've got our own finance teams. We have operations that keeps coming up. Um, you know, there's there's many other facets of the business that that this um, you know really intertwines with, and making sure that you have a focus on people, I think, is is really important. Um, the other thing is, is that, you know, is that what one uh, one size doesn't fit all in this. There's not a template on how to do this. You know, there's, you have to really roll up your sleeves and uh, kind of take, uh, you know, take that evolutionary path, um, you know, to, um, I mean, maybe, maybe you could do the revolutionary path, but that evolutionary path and try to figure out things that, as you go, um, fall down, get back up and um, pick up where you left off. Thank you, Matt. And finally, Michael. Well, fully support the point that Matt made. It, it budgeting, forecasting, it's a very specific topic for every company, and even more so, it's important that every company finds the right level um, of detail um, to run those forecasts and, and budgets. There is no right thing for all um, companies out there. So it's a very specific um, individual thing. Um, I personally always recommend to um, ask the question, what are our true value drivers? Um, find those out and then find a way how you can budget and plan on those. Um, 
if, if you haven't, I would really um, recommend to have a look at the systems out there because I think there's a, a lot of really good software that can support uh, you on the way there. And to close, I would go with one of Matt's uh, points, um, make people happy. I think that's a great uh, way of looking at things for finance people. Absolutely true. I think if we're all happy, the works get done. Uh, absolutely. Thank, thank you very much, uh, panelists. It is now our Q&A session. Good time for uh, Q&A. Uh, just to let uh, um, the attendees know that they, you can keep asking questions. We will get to your questions. We will get all of them answered via definitely via email. So please keep, if you've got any questions, please keep uh, sending them through. So our first question goes to Steve. Um, and Steve, what has been the biggest challenge by leadership in moving from annual budgets to beyond budgeting? And how can we as finance help make that transition? Well, the, the biggest change is they realize something's broken and it's not giving them what they need, but they don't know what to do instead. So all the attempts to get to better budgeting or try to try to do something to try to speed it up or it, it doesn't step back and represent you know address the fundamental flaws of saying is this fit for purpose so one thing doing it once a year in an, an annual spike it doesn't matter how good we can do we can't perfectly predict so you've got to step back and ask your management team really what they're what they're trying to achieve with planning what, are the, what does the annual budget do for them and break it apart. Go back to that slide that we had earlier about separate and improve and ask people how they set targets, how they reward people, how they uh, allocate resources, how they do their action planning, how they coordinate and how they hold on all together and how do they keep up, up with that. Instead of having a comparison against budgets, you could have a comparison just against a run rate. I mean, if every one of our businesses was constantly getting better at what they're trying to do, that would give you an easy comparison that's perpetual. It's not relying on anything. And you could compare it that. You could benchmark against other areas. So what we're experiencing now is new ways of visualizing, new ways of seeing things, and new techniques to achieve all the things managers want to achieve. But you've got to pull it out of them. You've got to get them defined. You know, if you want a budget, what do you want it to do? What do you, what's your business objective that you're trying to achieve? And then how am I positioning finance to do a better job of supporting the business? In so many situations, we're upside down. Finance is on top of the business and the business is supporting finance. So they got to stop doing, as Matt's example earlier, they got to stop doing their job to come support finance. We got to turn that back around. Otherwise, when the downsizing comes, get rid of the finance people because you get a twofer. You get you get rid of the finance person and the person that they were having support gets to go back to doing what he's supposed to we got to flip that around. We've got to get that out there where we're helping support people do their work and bringing them joy, as, as Matt said. Thanks, Steve. I, I feel you need another five minutes and you could uh, very easily go on to there. So uh, apologies because of timing. We have to, uh, to stop there. So um, our second question will go to uh, Naveen. And Naveen, how did you go about switching from traditional to beyond budgeting? A uh, couple, a few strands to this question. So, how did you go about switching from traditional to beyond budgeting? Did you Im immediately transition into beyond budgeting, or did you phase it out uh, slowly? Um, and what were the main points of focus during the process? So, at TW Telecom, like I described, it was a very revolutionary approach. Once we made the decision to change, it was more about just making it happen. And so within the space of a year, we went from designing a rolling forecast process to embracing this idea of change management and really enrolling our frontline leadership in this different approach. And, um, you know, figuring out how to communicate that, how to train people, how to test those, the messaging, how to basically roll out a process that was quite different than what we normally did. And like I said, it was far from perfect the first time through. It, it took a lot of constantly trying things and tweaking and adjusting and realizing what else we had just broken in the process by pulling the budget out of the organization because it has tentacles everywhere. And so yanking it out of there, um, you know, it, it, it really unraveled some things. But for us, culturally, at TW Telecom, it was a revolutionary change. We made the decision to go in that year, instead of doing a budget, we, we moved into this rolling forecast paradigm. Um, now, we were a publicly held company. We had a board with an audit committee, so they still wanted a calendar year view that aligned with our public reporting. So what we did 
rather than creating a budget in parallel or creating you know an actual budget process that runs alongside the forecast we literally dropped the four calendar quarters of our rolling forecast into a plan and, and, and gave it to the board as like here's this would be what we're expecting this coming calendar year to look like so they had a financial view of the business but we also re regularly at every board meeting essentially gave them an update to where we stood against it and so it wasn't like that was sort of a locked in thing it was more like this is informational this is a way to inform you as to what we're expecting the next calendar year to look like so i hope that kind of hits the high points of that question yes uh, naveen thank you very much for that actually it hits uh, uh, another question that i uh, i'd seen uh, around how do you manage uh, do you still do a budget and a rolling forecast within the company who is uh, quoted on the uh, stock exchange? So I think uh, I think you've uh, you've answered that as well. A anything you would like to elaborate on that one, Naveen? Well, no, I think it's really important though that we we um, acknowledge and and we you know let ourselves allow that that space that says we don't have to do a budget just because you're a public company. That's actually not one of the requirements. Reporting is definitely a requirement. Um, but the budget is not, and so there are def there are better ways to plan, and there are better ways to use that time towards things like making sure your financials are accurate and that you are reporting effectively instead of doing the budget work. So I mean, it, it's just such a time-consuming part of the business that we have to acknowledge that it's not necessary and not required as a public company. Yeah, Naveen, if I if I could, uh, Hans, that was sure. one of the things back in 2004 when Naveen first called me was okay she's trying to figure this out and so what are the questions so what a lot of the beyond budgeting research and literature does is it sets up the principles it's got numerous case studies and we have access to other our counterparts around the world so we were able to ask those questions and show people uh, handles banking doesn't have a budget we're able to bring up examples to show people so uh, this dialogue back and forth you're going to get questions you can't answer call on people who have done it before and, and let us kind of work with you to figure out where they are and then let us explore that uh, because that was some of the early work with TW Telecom and Naveen, I don't know how many reference calls you've done for us where other people are asking questions and uh, and you were the one that flipped the table 10 years later and explained to them exactly how you did it. So that's, that's sometimes you, you, you get the answer, sometimes you pay the answer forward. Absolutely, it, it, yeah, you have to talk to each other and, and talk to people who've done it before. So thank you. Thank you for that, Steve, and thank you, uh, Naveen. Our next question goes to uh, uh, Matthew. Um, Matt, what is your time horizon on your budget? Have you encountered totally unforeseen circumstances, and how did you deal with them? So, time horizon on the on the current budget. Um, so we we basically have so for our project speaking spe specifically about our project forecast so that top line you know revenue gross profit um we 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 ask for a focus on the next 12 months this is our current um you know kind of our current situation we do have um our projects are you know three to five years on average um so we we are trying to kind of meld what we call the life of contract uh, uh, management, uh, financial management with what we're calling a fiscal year management, which is currently that 12 month time horizon. We just got through a forecast where we, you know, where we changed a bunch of things in the forecast, we're, we're getting through a forecast um, that we, where we changed a bunch of uh, ways that we do things. And, you know, what we're finding out, at least in my opinion, um, is that we're, the, the time horizon when people can actually uh, see into the future of what's going to happen is really only a couple months. So when like Naveen was talking about, I can't remember what it was, two months or two quarters or something like that, um, uh, you know, we're finding that we actually probably need to shorten that time horizon, um, you know, how far we're looking out. And that's gonna be a that's gonna be a very scary, scary thing, but it definitely underscores the need for a good rolling forecast process. Um, so I'm not sure if that's much of an answer, but that's that's uh, you know currently 12 months, and now kind of looking into a, a shorter time horizon and, and and how we might be able to buy into that. Yeah, no, great great answer, Matt. Uh, of course, it's uh, you know 
it's a, it's a declining number of uh, uh, months is what we're aiming to uh, reduce the cycle, shorten it as much as we can, but get the most value out of it is, is the key thing. So thank you for that. And a final question to, to Michael. Michael, there's no doubt technology can help us on that journey to beyond budgeting. How, um, how do you deal with organizations that use technology to enhance their command and control? Um, what, what is your experience in this sort of matter? Again, Hans, uh, how? Uh, how do you deal with organizations that use technology to enhance command and control uh, mechanism within their uh, company? Well, to be honest, uh, it's a very natural thing, right? Um, you've set your budget, your rolling forecast um, in the system, uh, which includes hundreds of opinions. Uh, you get your final uh, approval, and then you simply start your um, reporting where people um, explain, well, uh, how are things going? Where are things going well and where not? And um, of course, this has um, ultimately always the goal to make things uh, better um, for the company, um, either to stop spending on things that uh, go uh, or perform poorly. Um, and if you look at the bright side of life to um, encourage more investments um, in areas that overperform. So I, I honestly just, you know, don't really look at it in, in a sense of regulation and uh, administration. Yeah. I really just see it as a natural um, process. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, our panelists. We've got loads of other questions. We will get all of these questions answered via email uh, to the people who have asked us. So uh, panelists, thank you very much. If you would like to um, switch off your uh, webcam, I've got a couple more slides to uh, take people through and then we should conclude our meeting uh, very shortly. So uh, we've got an FPNA Empowerment Survey 2021 that we're hoping to close this week. Please participate. We have over 400 uh, senior finance professionals that have given their insight into it. It should take you 10 to 12 minutes to do. Uh, more importantly, you will get a personalized copy uh, on your email as well as uh, a copy on a BI tool which you can use uh, to compare your company against other companies. So uh, please uh, do fill the empowerment survey. You could see there's a, um, there's a link there as well. Um, finally, a couple of key dates for you. FPNA Trends webinar talking about uh, revenue planning for better FPNA insights. We have got two leading uh, case studies, one from Microsoft and one from Emirates. Uh, where they are doing, doing, making use of AI in their revenue planning. So uh, keep the date, April 28th, please join us for that. And then on May the 12th, uh, we've got how to manage uncertainty with FP&A predictive uh, analytics. Uh, please register, registration is open. Uh, finally, on our thank you slide, so I would like to take this opportunity to thank Unit4 for sponsoring the event, of course, FPNA Trends as well. To thank our esteemed member of the panel um, for their insightful presentation, um, and um, also to thank all of our uh, attendees today um, for giving us their insightful participation. I hope uh, you have had a, a very a good learning uh, capability and had some great time with us. Uh, finally, let me just leave you with uh, how to uh, connect with ourselves. Um, I will now conclude this meeting and uh, when I close the meeting, of course, you will get a feedback session. So please, if you can give us your feedback, that will be uh, excellent. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed the meeting and we hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. That concludes our meeting for today. Bye bye.